if you look at any of like the old uh, like murals and stuff that Native Americans did on cave walls, they're all and big stuff, bucks. Yeah, none of them Very are none does. of them are a button buck <laughs> or a doe. Like they're all they're all oh, big yeah. antlers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's there. Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Man, it's almost food plot season, Jared, and Deer Grow is one of those products that has really changed the way that we plant food plots and the success we've seen from them. No doubt. I've been, you know, trying to plant food plots my, my entire you know, whitetail hunting career, which is a little shorter than yours, but the minute that I started or that I, you know, I realized that I could get Deer Grow back into some of these remote plots where I couldn't get lime or fertilizer, especially in the 50 pound bag, you know, format, mm -hmm. so everything was changed. You know, I could get into these spots uh, moving forward with a, with a backpack sprayer and that's since escalated to these 40 or 60 uh, gallon sprayers and we're doing upwards of you know five to ten acre food plots just with your grow and having phenomenal success yeah and i mean with the price of fertilizer lime diesel everything this year i mean what better way to get in there and grow a successful food plot at about a third of the cost check out deer grow at deergrow.com and we're back hey yo on our podcast episode 91 as nick keeps us in line <laughs> thanks nick you know what it's September 1st. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you're listening to this, it's not September 1st, but it is September 1st when we record this. Yeah, it is. Dude, I had, uh, <laughs> I had an ice cream cone last night to just uh, mark the end of the <laughs> end of summer. Small vanilla. Small vanilla. Our, no our, pumpkin. I, I mean, I know you guys no, are pushing it down there pretty hard. I'm a small vanilla man. <laughs> uh, how boring. <laughs> wow. I like to keep... Not even like sp sprinkles? Definitely not sprinkles. Wow. <laughs> Or Jimmy's. As you own an like ice cream Jimmy's. shop and you're like, small vanilla? Well, I like to keep it consistent. So if I go from <laughs> shop to shop, I have an even baseline. Okay. Small vanilla. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Dave Portnoy, the pizza review guy. Exactly. I got you. Just cheese. No no fancy stuff. Oh. That's what sure. he does. Sure. Yeah, it, I mean. That was an analogy I was using. Yeah. Yeah. So I just keep it simple. And But anyways, yeah, it was August 31st yesterday, September 1st today. Ugh. Dude, yeah, I was going to text you. I don't, I'm not sure why I got busy or something. But it yesterday, I think, was the first, like, it was cold front yesterday. We had that rain come through on. Oh, I know. I ate dinner outside, and there was, like, a cool breeze and mm -hmm. stuff. I'm like, this is great. It was cold this morning. I almost put a hoodie on. I was like, I'll tell you what. Well, I sent you a picture this morning. Like, the bucks are shedding out like crazy right now. Yeah. I mean, just velvet hanging August off 1st, all man, over the set place. The, set the calendar. Yeah, I mean, it's it's wild. So, you know, I think we got a good rain in, in our area, at least. I know some people are still struggling in drought a conditions. Lot. But we got a good rain. I mean, at this point, we're like on the home stretch. In fact, two days from now, the boys and I will be in Kentucky hunting early season. Yep. You know, and we still got a ways for Ohio and, and Pennsylvania openers. And our guest is a Michigan guy. I think that's October 1st as well Yeah. for openers. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it, but we're there. You know, football season, college football season starts today, which is great. I've had several people text me. They're like, hey, on my way to North Dakota, like, uh, oh. We like did. We you know, up and we drew. Shot. We just passed this year. We, yeah. We we drew for North Dakota, but we, man, it's been that drought's been hard up there. So we just took a pass this year. I do think that they've got some rain recently. Mm -hmm. So next year we'll probably put back in and hopefully it's rebounded. Yeah, dude. I um, it hurts a little bit. Like not I, being in the Badlands. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Just not mule deer hunting. Like I'm I'm ex so I'm going to. I'm doing an elk hunt, mm -hmm. you know, third week of September, and, and I'm super excited. About it. It's going to be an awesome time. But I've had to, like, intentionally, like, hype myself up about it, you know, because mm -hmm. like I, I don't typically spend a lot of time, you know, this is, this is where YouTube is uh, is beneficial. I guess, you know, so this time of year, you know, what gets me hyped up is to see, okay, what, what's this about? What is mm -hmm. I, you know, Even though I've been on one Colorado elk hunt, that was years and years sure. ago. Um, I'm, you know, I just what you go on YouTube, you're like Colorado elk hunt, Colorado bow hunt. So you got guys like, um, Hushin and the, the go hunt guys and, you know, whoever that's like, you know, got, got some, some good stuff on there that is pertinent to what we're doing. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's getting me psyched up, but it's in the back of my mind. I'm like, it's just different. It's different well, I mean, we, we just started to get that badlands hunting down. Like we, we started to feel very comfortable with our strategies yeah. and our plans and, we will again, you know, I, I think it was the right decision to pass this year um, because of, of what's happened the last two years in a drought situation. But Oh, um, I could care less about the drought. I think it's it's just work. It's just work sure. in life. Situ like, we just, we can only swing so much. Mm -hmm. at a time. Yeah, which I'm excited to go hunt this weekend with the kids in Kentucky and have a chance at Velvet, you know, and 
Um, I, we haven't had that for the last two years because we've been in the Dakotas. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, man, finally on that home stretch. Feels like summer lasted forever, and now we're yeah. we're there to to hammer this thing home. Yep. So, uh, we have a guest today uh, from Michigan. Uh, Jake Elinger. So I'm sure several people probably listen to this more than several, uh, have heard that name. In fact, they probably requested that name to be on here. Um, so Jake's got a pretty heavy deer management and habitat background, but, but obviously, uh, you know, passionate bow hunter as and well. Business as well as you run a consulting yep, habitat solutions, 360. Um, yeah. you know, and so we'll let Jake fill us in on that, but, um, business has been, you know, he's been doing consulting for a long time, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and really, I think, you know, from his background, um, and what I'm excited to hear from Jake today is just, you know, his background in creating better deer habitat and, and, and everything is culminating from a hunting focus and situation. Um, you know, and he himself has even, you know, evolved from, you know, killing, you know, whatever bucks he could find to now, I think in this pre podcast, he was talking about, you know, he focuses solely on four and a half and older bucks. Um, so well, dude, what, what a great case study or, um, just example of somebody who, you know, somebody might just, you know, come across our channel on, mm -hmm. on YouTube or TikTok or something and be like, Oh, these guys are elitist or, you know, they they are only hunting whatever it is. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I can see how that could come across to, to, you know, to somebody who's, um, but that's not what it is. Whatever. I think that Jake's story is a really cool one. And and obviously we got a lot to learn from him here, but he's somebody who, um, initially, you know, and it was because of the circumstances that, um, the opportunities, I suppose Mm -hmm. that the, that the state presented to a hunter, you know, and eventually a, a bow hunter. And then as the industry evolved and, um, you know, I think he's kind of seen a course of time here where, uh, you know, that there, the equipment was very low quality, Yep. you know, and so o- over this course of time, all these things have changed, I think, and he's, he's evolved to, um, n- not that one is better or worse, but there is a more, Oh, I think the evolved is the key evolved, word. I mean, yeah. we've talked about that into where like, yeah, when I grew up hunting, I mean, the first, you know one horn spike at three inches I shot like didn't like that's just how I grew up you know I shot plenty of button bucks when I was growing up you know and but as a hunter like I've evolved to the point where now you know I try to hunt a specific deer and usually that deer is four and a half or older yeah um and and I don't I'm not saying that as an elitist from a trophy hunting perspective it's that is my goal and challenge and if I don't tag anything I'm okay with it like that's that's just my goal for the season and you know, I think there's a lot of us out there that think of it that way. I think that until you have put yourself in an evolution situation, frankly, you can't understand yeah. that. That's why you may see it as, well, these guys are elitist. They're bow hunters only. They're only killing four and a half and five year old bucks. No, no, no. It's not an elitist standpoint. It's the evolution of challenging ourselves and enjoying the white tailed deer throughout the season. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. You know, it's it's easy to like get defensive when somebody um says that, Hey, there's a higher, le- there's more to this thing that you're, you know, and, and that's not out of looking down on somebody, but it's to say, Hey, that's, that's awesome. Well, I appreciate like where I've you're at there. in this thing. I, we've been there. Yeah. You know, Jake, I think has been there and, and, and way past where we're at even, but it's like, man, l- look deeper at what the sport has to offer, mm-hmm. you know, and consider, um, d- you know, growing or developing yourself as, as a hunter, as a bow hunter, as mm-hmm. you, you know, whatever that ultimately is for you. And, uh, so it's cool to see, you know, how Jake's story played out there. And I think that there are people that will never evolve, but it's just because, and I don't mean this in a bad way, they just don't love it and live it as much as some of us do. And that's okay. That's okay. Like if you just like to hunt and that's part of uh, your annual thing, great. Yeah. There's a group of us and Jake is one of them who live for deer year round. Um, and, and I should say, stress, it really is okay. I mean, yeah, if, it if is. you really it is. just want to get out and, and just, it's something you do twice, twice a year, yep. that's fine. You know, within the, the legal, I mean, we're not here to say that, you know, hunting has to be that or has to be that. That's the beauty of mm-hmm. it is it's, it's, it's different for everyone. And, but understand the perspective we're about to get in with Jake, which is that evolution. Yeah. Also appreciate our approach to it. Mm-hmm. So, all right, let's bring in Jake. Hey, Jake. Okay. Hey, we gotcha. Guys. All right, man. Well, listen, I, I assume, did you hear uh, some of that opening there? I know you're on Yeah, mute. I did. Okay. Yeah. Do you think we're off base there, Jake? I mean, it, you know, first off, thanks for coming on. But, you know, you hear kind of us talk about, 
and it, it, it's hard because we live it all year. Like, how do you put in perspective that, that evolution, you know, as a hunter? Number one, I would agree with that. Um, I think some of us are more passionate about our hobbies than others, right? Yes. And um, there's no doubt, it, you know, for myself and you guys, uh, even though I don't know you that well, listening to the uh, pre-podcast conversation, you guys live and and, uh, and drink deer hunting yes. 24-7. Yes. And you're going to run into hunters uh, that don't, and that's fine. And uh, I think one of the things you guys said about uh, how myself and and a couple of you guys included um, have moved to the point to where we target older age class animals or specific animals, and it truly is the challenge. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then depending on what state you're hunting, what the habitats are like, uh, hunter density, deer densities, that challenge can be, you know, really really difficult or pretty obtainable so that's what makes you know the white-tailed deer and just you know the midwest uh the white-tailed deer's range just so neat and interesting and even though i've seen a lot of cool things in my life and traveled so many different states helping hunters i tell you i learn every time i go to a property so uh, i just don't stop learning and and that's the best part of it is yeah what you learn, what you can take away every time you walk into the woods or out into a field. And, and uh, so, yeah, I, I love the evolution. You know, some people don't want that and that's fine, but uh, man, it's, it's neat going through uh, I, the journey, you know, the best way I can say it. Well, and, and I think it was probably John Eberhardt that we had this discussion with and, and Jake, I'm sure you're familiar with Eberhardt, um, you know, another Michigan yes. guy up there. You know, yeah. and, and we had that discussion, Michigander. Michigander, yeah, we had that discussion in that the fact, I think we were talking about Pennsylvania, you know, and like, let's say you set your goal at, um, you know, 170 inch buck and, and that's fine. Like, uh, trust me, I mean, I, I want to kill a big buck every year if the possibility, but if that 170 inch buck does not exist, like it may not exist in, in a 20 or 30 mile radius of where you're hunting. Like you're literally hunting a ghost. Like the, the the goal is not attainable. And so that's where, you know, Jared and I have talked and Jake, I'm glad you brought it up earlier in the beginning podcast. We talk about the age structure and setting an age structure goal or, or a specific deer goal allows you to know that your time of field is attainable for, for a goal. Yeah. Yeah. Be realistic about your expectations. Yeah. Well, well, doesn't it start with like a baseline like sure the, doesn't any goal that kind of develops out of like you know interest in in, in development start from like well okay i i did this or mm-hmm. or i've seen this done i know i know that this is it's here yeah and whatever that is i mean i think and i'm gonna we'll ask you know jake in a bit here to share like his his entire ev- from small game and, and from mm-hmm. trapping and stuff i know we share some some similar backgrounds and like so for me it would you know, even at a young age of like 12 or whatever it was, it, I never had the thought of, I want to kill Booner or I want to kill a four-year-old. That, that <laughs> didn't register. That didn't even exist, mm-hmm. you know, as much I didn't as, even know what a Booner was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you walk it all the way back to like, you know, first thought was, I want to kill a deer. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, because I've seen, yeah. you know, my, my dad and, and this, I've seen this hunting camp this has been happening. I've been maybe a part of this, like without a weapon. I want, I want to kill a deer or maybe it's even, I want to see a deer Yeah, where, you know, and that could be dependent on region or whatever your, your upbringing was, but it has to start somewhere. Well, yeah. I mean, even look at the, and Jake, I know you've probably gone through this. Think of like, uh, like when I grew up, people only talked about bucks in terms of points. I was so-and-so killed an eight point and you're like, damn. Yeah. It didn't matter that that could have been a seven inch spread. Yeah. You know, we didn't, we didn't yeah. even know. We just so, oh, he killed an eight point. That's awesome, man. Yeah. You know, and then it was maybe an eight point with an X inch spread and then it became score and then it became eight. Like even that evolution in the last 25, 30 years, you know, has been crazy to watch. Yeah. You're right. You know, uh, you hear a lot about score today. Yeah. Or 20 years ago, nobody talked about nobody, score, you know, 
you know, like I said, it was eight point, you know, 10 point. Oh my gosh, 10 point. Well, like I said, it could be, little, could be a basket rack 10 point, but man, he killed a 10 point. Exactly. And that, and I think that's cool because that is the baseline, right? For, for all of us who experienced the last 25 years or so, you know, that is the baseline that's come about from, from that, you know, just points to score and age now. Um, yeah. I, I think that that comes from a, a better understanding of, of the animal, like as mm-hmm. you know, interest has b- developed around white-tailed deer hunting. I don't know. I don't. Know, I'm not sure the time frame. Let's call it 30 or 40 years. Like, I'll well, see. My, so my dad's, you know, 58. So mm-hmm. when he was like in his 20s, like that was the time. Jake, can I ask how how old are you, Jake? 68. 68. Okay, so you got yeah. 10, 10 years on my dad there. Mm-hmm. So like maybe in your thirties. And so, and again, I'm gonna ask you to share your story. So maybe it's even goes back even further than this, but, um, it was like, it was such a feat. I, I can recall just from my dad and my uncle telling me to, to kill a deer with a bow, like, yes. like back then. And this is in Pennsylvania, oh. you know, so, yeah, so Michigan's so, probably the same. So that was the thing. It was like, man, is this even possible? Can we kill a deer with a bow? And then, so, you know, fast forward, you know, I think at some point the, the number of points got introduced as a potential. The width definitely got, you know, the spread was a, a point of interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the weight at some point oh, sure. became of interest. And then ultimately, I think age and score and understanding ultimately, like, w- what is the ultimate form of maturity in an animal? Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of a culmination of weight, age, uh you know, and ultimately, you know, we use score as kind of like a, a way to assign a number to that. But um, yep. anyways, I, I think it's cool to see how each one of those like um, factors of like what a whitetail can be ultimately has culminated into what we find interest in. But but still, dude, there are a lot of areas of the country, like even off the top of my head in Ohio, they have like a, a big buck club. And it's like, hey, the t- way they entered it is they just measure the width. Just spread. Just the spread. Really? And that's like yeah. the thing. And so you have people in that neck of the woods being like, oh, you know, I saw a 19 inch the other day. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? But that's that's the thing that's like appealing wow. to them. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Jake, yep. give us, get, let's let's set the tone for our listeners. I, again, I, I know a ton of them have, have followed you and, and seen you, but, you know, start us off with um, kind of, you know, your upbringing in Michigan and, and you know, where did this... Uh, I don't know, call it addiction, because that's usually what I call it for myself. You know, where did this addiction around deer habitat and management and, and hunting come from? Well, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I just grew up in a pretty uh, humble, uh, blue collar family. Uh, my parents, uh, I'm blessed to have the two parents that uh, I had that were very avid trappers and small game hunters. So at a very young age, um, they they joke to this day and say, uh, I was three days old when I went into my first uh, trapping expedition. <laughs> they took me along <laughs> running trap lines, okay, mm-hmm. and doing things, you know. And, uh, you know, so so during that time, you know, I was born in the uh, early 50s. So there was very few white-tailed deer, but there was an abundant small game population. And things were different, you know. Uh, you know, there weren't uh, the private ownership of property was not uh, coveted as it is today. So property lines were not a big factor. I can still remember mm-hmm. as a young kid, my father and I could take off from the house where we lived, which is three quarters of a mile from where I'm uh, sitting at today, and walk until it was dark, small game hunting in one direction wow. and just go from one farm. And my dad knew every one of those owners, okay? He knew so and so and so and so and. Uh, some of the farms were fairly large farms and, and not giant, but, you know, four to 600 acre farms. And some of these farms were 40 acre, 60 acre farms. Uh, but, you know, uh, rabbits, squirrels, uh, ducks and pheasants was kind of, you know, as far as hunting. I started right out very young hunting all of those animals and trapping muskrats and mink and foxes. Um, there was a bounty here in Michigan for several years when I was young. And it was amazing, you know, for me as a uh, 10 to 12 year old boy to trap foxes. And I don't know if you guys have ever trapped oh, yeah. foxes before. Yeah. And in the springtime, we would trap them. And of course, you get you get all the little ones, too. Yeah. And then you go to the not only do you get the money for the pelts, but then you go to the 
the local at that time we'd go to the local sheriff's department and they would put a an ear tag punch in each ear and pay us five dollars a box. Well, that was that was unheard of money for a ten and twelve year old. Okay, <laughs> I walked around with fifty dollars because I I got mom and dad and eight babies. You know, wow. one week. You know? And I know it seems kind of ruthless, but I mean, you know, that was no. the focus was yep. was small game and. And, and with a lot of small game predators, you know, have a huge impact on the population. So there was that was why the state of Michigan paid that bounty was to uh, bring the pheasant populations up and, uh, and other. So, yeah, that was my beginning. And uh, I'm going to say about time I was 10 to 12 years old, you would occasionally see a white tailed deer. And I still remember I was probably like six or seven. My dad drove home from work and just come in the house kind of yelling at the family hey kids you know everybody get in the car there's a deer down the field and we jumped in his ford station wagon and drove down and he showed us a deer out in the field and that was the first deer i'd ever seen wow and they were so rare you know compared to where we're at today well and that's so, so hard uh, for people to fathom i think listening to this of of you know like i drove home from a property the other day and like i don't know i saw 95 deer probably and you know three or four different fields total you know, and so to hear that kind of a story, you know, for so many of us now is like, you know, I think we take it for granted. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and, and there's a lot of people that just um, have not grown up during those times. And it's just hard to believe that at one time there weren't those kinds of deer numbers. Mm -hmm. But over the time, you know, uh, the deer numbers did increase. And when we got into the mid to upper 60s, they started having, uh, of course, they always had a, a a firearms buck season and a, and a and a bow hunting season but then they started having you know antlers permits back in those days they were doe permits right so, you know you know the emotions that stirred up in, <laughs> in hunting states like michigan and and it was a draw you know you would send in for a permit and uh, i can remember when i finally turned 14 because there were no youth seasons in michigan so i was finally able to deer hunt at 14. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you apply for the doe permit. And sure enough, I got one. And so my first uh, whitetail was a button buck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, I was I was as proud of that as a yeah. as a 160 inch, you know, 10 point. And uh, I shot it with a muzzle loader, actually a flintlock muzzle loader. If you guys are familiar oh, yeah. with those. Love and that. yeah, that was, you know, my dad was was big into muzzle loaders as a kid. He loved shooting them and had buddies of his and he, and he made them. He's an incredible gunsmith. And uh, yeah, so I, I actually shot my first deer with a uh, flintlock, 50 caliber flintlock patch and ball that my father made for me as oh, a kid. Wow. And, uh, you know, that's, that was the evolution. And uh, so, you know, as the years went by and you'd see the occasional antler, I really became, you know, what, you know, how can I learn about these deer? How can I get close? You know, I got to kill a buck sort of thing. And, and so that went. And as it turned out, I killed my first antlered buck with a, a a bow, and it was when Bear Archery came out with that first uh, compound called the uh, Whitetail Hunter. If you guys oh, yeah. have ever seen one of those, my dad has. The, uh, that's what, when you say had. when you say the first, I mean, is that the the first? I'm showing my age here. First, well, compound? I mean, it was the first uh, compound bow that Bear <clears throat> Archery marketed. I believe Jennings Bow Company was the first company. First to mm -hmm. sell and actually offer a compound, but it was the first. And yeah, I, I shot with recurves and I shot some does and button bucks with recurves and cedar arrows and all yep. that stuff. No, oh, man, you know, when you use the term fling and arrows, that's definitely <laughs> what I was doing. <laughs> you know, I was any, I, any idea, Jake, like roughly when were those compound bows like introduced, whether it was Jennings or, or Bear? Um, I'm going to say that probably was early 70s yeah mid 70s and was that yeah. a, wow that not a, that long ago dude. that original bear whitetail those were wooden compounds right well no okay nope. it had a it had a cast riser oh um, it did i'm gonna say a, a combination aluminum and some other materials okay uh, you know because uh, maybe dad, i'm not really sure my dad had a bear i don't know what it was it but it was a it was a compound, but it was a wooden compound. Yeah, because he wrapped it in camo the duct tape. The limbs too. <laughs> yep. Yes, because yep. I remember. And Darton, Darton was a very 
uh, popular bow yep. company in Michigan that grew real fast, and they started out with the wooden risers. Got and it. I actually I shot several yeah. of them, as, you know, as I progressed and wanted to get into more accuracy and mm-hmm. just ease of holding back. You know, sure. The old, you know, the term let off that we have today. Well, there was no what let off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. You, not at all. If you were shooting sixty five pounds, you felt them. You know. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, but. It, it was all, it's all great, you know, so as the time went on, um, I started getting a little more proficient. This was prior to uh, my wife and I owning any property, so I was a knock-on-doors guy, okay, mm-hmm. and, and met a local farmer about maybe 15 miles from where I'm at right now, and uh, he allowed me to bow hunt and gun hunt, and he had like a 160-acre property, but that also meant he let everybody else gun hunt and bow hunt, yeah. so I found out real quick there was you know, significant hunting pressure. And so I, I, I figured out where the deer were and where the other hunters weren't and that sort of thing. And then in 1981, uh, my wife and I uh, purchased the 67 acres that uh, I'm sitting on right now. And that's where I in, embarked in my habitat improvement and my, uh, I would say my evolution in, you know, going from shooting button bucks to then saying no more button bucks i'm going to start uh, trying to kill some year and a half so i mean it was you know and then no more year and a half so i'm gonna i'm gonna try and and shoot two and a half and made that evolution you know and and as technology got better and then just information became available sure you, know, you, you go back into the 70s there wasn't a magazine you could pick up that you could read that talked about deer score deer management uh Nobody wrote about scrapes. Nobody knew about what scrapes do, why bucks and does use them. I mean, compared to this knowledge, which is now so easily available to so many people. So uh, I would say probably by the time I got into my upper 20s, early 30s, I really started focusing on trying to get an opportunity on a mature deer. And and, and for me back in those days, that was like a three-year-old buck. I, you know, I didn't always make it. Sometimes I'd kill a, a really good two-year-old sure. okay, that I thought was three. But then I would say, yeah, about 1981, uh, in, when I bought this property, about that time is when I made that change. Okay. Jake, and I what, went back and forth a little bit. Sorry. No, you're fine. Well, I was going to say, when you when you talked about kind of that information period, what, what sources at that time, let's say late 70s, early 80s, were you – diving into to to try to educate yourself and learn and understand you know uh one of the first magazines that came out with real deer biology information why deer do what they do was the deer and deer hunting magazine Mm -hmm. yep and i was one i i remember i subscribed i believe their first or second year they came out wow and i subscribed all those years and that's how i actually discovered uh you call land management, deer management, sure. uh, through an article written by Joe Hamilton yep. and a couple other guys from down in the Texas area explaining what they were doing. You know, and you'd read these articles on these, you know, 6,000 acre ranches and I'd go, well, geez, you know, what's that got to do with <laughs> right. you know, little old me here in Michigan with 67 acres, you know, but uh, I found out, you know, uh, through trial and error, you know, certain things do work and deer are deer and, uh, you know, deer just wants to, you know, be uh safe and happy and have uh, plenty of food, plenty of cover and girls yeah. during certain mm-hmm. times of the year. And, uh, you know, th- through that progression, um, you know, I can, I still remember, you know, when the goal was just Pope and Young, you know, just try and kill a Pope and Young. And for so many years, Southern Michigan, which has a very high hunter uh, density, just seeing or, or having a piece of property and finding a, a buck that would score, say, 120 inches, okay, that was a big deal. And that wasn't that long ago. I'd say, you know, 20 years ago, that was really, that was a big thing. If you were in Michigan with a bow, killing something in that 120 to 125 inch range. Okay. And I mean, you know, you think about all the years that, that I would hunt and the observation data and how few bucks I would see on the hook that made 120 sure. inches. Jake, what, you know, <laughs> real quick, while you're on the subject, what what is the what do you think was like the the motivator to 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 try to you know we say it as progress you know in terms of bigger, older, higher scoring, but like at at that time, what 
you know, what was it that I think like lit a fire in you and, and, and other bow hunters to say, I want to shoot, whether it's a bigger deer or a higher scoring deer, like what, what was kind of like, what, what were people shooting for? You know, um, I, I, you know, you guys touched on this a little bit, you know, early on in the conversation. You get to a certain point, you know, you set a goal, whatever that goal is, a year and a half, two and a half. And then, and then you start achieving that. Okay. And mm-hmm. I don't care if you're climbing a mountain, you know, eventually, you know, Mount Everest is boring. Right. Right. You know? And so that, that was for me, that was the motivator. And a lot of my personal friends that were deer hunters that I would communicate with, we were all kind of arriving at the same, uh, the same, uh, location at the same time. And that is, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to learn about older age class and how how great it is to hunt them because there's so much there there you know there's a big difference between trying to hunt a four and a half year old buck and a year and a half old buck yeah as far as you know being able to see him during daylight and and just you know have him in front of you within archery range and so that was you know I I think a two pronged thing you know number one just the challenge and then. Hey, I've, I've got a basket, right? You know, everybody's got a box or a basket of their year and a half olds and two and a half old yep. racks, and they just don't want to kill any more of those. Sure. So, uh, I think this happened in Pennsylvania too, but within Michigan with this information age, a lot more, uh, a lot more people were being touched with, uh, you know, the idea or the thought process of if we can start communicating and passing younger bucks, we could actually have a few older age class bucks around, mm-hmm. given, you know, they don't die to predation and, and get hit by cars, cars and trucks yeah. and that sort of thing. Yep. And that has really picked up steam. And if there's anything, you know, Michigan is, is a very well-known state for its popularity of neighborhood co-ops, mm-hmm. you know, which are neighbors that get together. And we have a co-op right here in my area, a small one, but yet. Our, our core group are really good guys. And right. We, uh, you know, we all uh, get together once or twice a year and congratulate one another on the bucks. And often, you know, we will shake, you know, I'll shake one of the neighbor's hands and congratulations. What a beautiful deer you killed. And, or, you know, they're shaking my hand and I'm thanking them for the fact that they have passed that deer once or twice in the last three or four years. Mm-hmm. Very okay. cool. And, uh, and that's what's happening here in Michigan, you know, regardless of our, uh, our current management strategy within our Department of Natural Resources and the uh, political uh, yep. mechanism that, that is involved in all that. The hunters in Michigan want to hunt better deer. And hunters control the deer that are being killed by their trigger finger or their release finger on their arrows. And that's really happening. It doesn't mean it's happening with everyone, but sure. there's a big change that I've seen take place in the last... I'd say for sure 15 years. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's, and, a, and, that's a big discussion point that we have and, and we kind of had earlier here is like, you know, there, there are a lot of people where, let's say, opening day a rifle is just a day during the year and they participate in it, but then the rest of the year, uh, they're not really thinking about hunting, right? They're not really, you know, excited right. about it or anything. It's just opening day or deer camp for, for opening weekend. Like that. that's what they look forward to then I think there has been an increasing group, uh, you know, I don't know what percentage of the hunters in every state it is, that literally most of the year are thinking about deer hunting and habitat, and and they're doing other things. They're small game hunting, they're turkey hunting, they're fishing. But, you know, deer hunting is more than just a few days a year to them, right? And And I think as that group continues to grow, what you're saying there, Jake, becomes more and more realistic, which is, we, we can kill better deer here. Well, you know, it, real quick, oh, yeah. it, it, it's, I've observed also, like, and I give you credit, Jake, for developing and like, and holding out, you know, to where at one time, you know, maybe you were killing whatever it was, a one, two year old buck to, to now, you know, you're passing these deer. I think, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll use like my, my dad and uncle and some other guys in our group as great example. And, you know, I love these guys. These are guys in our hunting camp and, and they are really trying to, to progress as well. But because I think it was, you know, cemented in their minds 
at like the peak of, I don't call it the peak of, like when they were most invested in their hunting careers, which was in their in 20s and 30s, mm -hmm. you know, as, as the industry was starting to pick up and this information was becoming available and they were, you know, some of the first guys finding success as bow hunters killing a points, yep. you know, that was, that was like the, the thing. It seems like they've struggled to, to get beyond that point, maybe because of the limitations of the state that they hunt or whatever it is. So to where now, you know, we're super blessed to have an opportunity to hunt like in Ohio, a state that offers in some cases, a, a you know, an older age class of deer that has potential to grow Boone and Crockett animals, certainly Pope and Young mm -hmm. fairly frequently. Um, and I know that those guys really struggle to detach themselves from that time where it was like, man, success was to kill a buck every year, to kill a buck every year. That was like the pinnacle. And so now when a two or three year old walks in front of them, it's really hard for them mm -hmm. to get out of that, you know, killer instinct mindset. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, and for some people, it's just every time it's a struggle. Yeah. And I can say, you know, personally, there was a time I would watch that deer walk away and I go, man, I just can't believe I let that deer walk by. And now, quite honestly, I, I get very excited about letting nice deer go by. Yeah, me too. With, with, the, with the hope, you know, and, and clearly in, in the state and the region I'm in, not every whitetail survives. Okay. He walks off the property and dies, gets hit by a car, relocates. So much can happen. But. I can tell you, I, you know, the last four or five really nice deer I've killed on this farm were deer that I let go by that I had some history with. And that's just a blast too. Well, so I, it's like, so you take the risk, you let him go and you go, what will he be next year? And then, and then he does. Okay. Yeah. It's kind, it's, of, it's pretty, it's kind of, pretty a, cool. it's kind of a bizarre phenomenon to like, I, I know that I've experienced in the past. And I think, you know, these guys in my group that I'm mentioning, there's a feeling of when you, you pass a deer that you're hoping will make it another year. Uh, and then next, the, the following week or whatever, he gets shot. There's a feeling of, oh, I could have, I shot a shot that deer a week ago. And I understand that sure. feeling, but I, and I don't know at what point this happened. Now, when that happens, I don't, I don't have that feeling of, oh, I should have shot that deer at all. No, I, I still, my feeling at that point is still very much well. I yeah, I did what I could have there, and yeah, it sucks that he got killed. But like, pa you know, having passed that deer it, to me is better. I say as good as, if not better, than having killed it because I could have, I, mm -hmm. I could have. But then, what do you have? You have a dead deer. Well, and, and, and you're mean, like, what do I do? Do I I, I? I think that's the big piece for a lot of people. I mean, let's let's not kid ourselves. There is a satisfaction in killing a buck. I mean, if you kill a buck with your bow, there is a satisfaction in that feeling and that accomplishment. There's also some shooter's remorse there if it's not the deer that you were hoping to set out for to target. Um, well, and it can be a pretty, you know, call it a gray area or a slippery slope, depending on, you know, your goal and, and how that uh, situation ultimately unfolded. The remorse can be in some cases greater than the I'll tell you greater what, than the satisfaction my biggest remorse on a deer and it doesn't matter if even if it's the deer that I set out to hunt in a year is if I shoot that deer early in the year I have remorse in that I won't be sitting out there hunting during the rut or the late season or whatever else like I'm, I'm literally sitting out the Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Dude, where would we be without our Hoyt bows? Probably shooting crossbows <laughs> or, or a Matthews yeah <laughs> One in the same. Yeah. But in all seriousness, we love being Hoyt guys because you stand out. When you're in this room full of other people that shoot these other types of bows, I feel like the Hoyt guys just stick out. Uh, Dude, it's just a legit bow. I mean, th th especially that carbon riser, man. I mean, I, I know that they've got several other aluminum lines as well. But for, for me, I'm shooting that RX-5 uh, in the carbon model. They've since come out with RX-7. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love being a Hoyt guy amongst a sea full of Matthews guys. So we're out there, I think, pr proving them wrong, shooting 80 pounds and uh, you know, killing stuff. Hey, man, if you want to get serious, get Hoyt. I get that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, on the other hand, it's nice to go out on your very first hunt of the oh, season yeah. and the, 
the specific shooter buck that you've got on your list shows up and sure. you and you make a clean harvest and you and you've gotten him, there's but no you don't get to hunt him in the rut because, yeah i mean I, I you know there's a lot of discussion about who you know who prefers early season sure. you know the rut season late season but in in my world you know there is just nothing beats that magic two weeks of late october and november just you know, the frosty mornings, the way that deer, you know, the deer woods can be, you know, pandemonium or dead yeah. quiet. Yeah. yeah. And, and just, you know, when a target buck does come through and he's making all this noise and he's grunting and he's got his ears back, his hair's all standing up on his hackles. And man, you know, that is just so cool when he comes through the gap that you were hunting, you know, in the wind direction, you know, you, you did everything right. That part is awesome. No uh, doubt. Well, yeah. And that's where I think that, you know, for me, and this is what I think set off my evolution as, because I killed a bunch of two-year-olds. I want, I want to stay on that. Stuff. I think you're in it here still, but that hunter for more subject yeah. is a very interesting. Well, so one. that that's what set mine off is that you know, I, it, where I hunted in Pennsylvania, I, if I wanted to kill a one or probably even a two-year-old, you know, at least in my teens and early twenties, I won't say that it was easy, but it was very, very attainable. Every hunt that I went out, like the the chance to kill one of those deer. Uh, could have happened to any hunt that I was out there. Yeah. So my my remorse came in in that I did that enough to where I was like, man, what if I didn't shoot those? Like, would those bigger bucks that I had seen show up in Halloween, first week of November, et cetera? So my remorse quickly became the evolution, which was I don't want to shoot these one- and two-year-olds in October, knowing that the last week of October into the first couple weeks of November is where those giants started to show up that, you know, had been ghost previous to that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You, I, for, like for me, regardless of the time of year, and, and I agree with what you guys are saying, like last two weeks of October is, yeah, you want to experience that. I think for, for me, the greatest like remorse that I've experienced in the deer woods is when I've got a, a goal set for myself, either on a specific animal or on a certain, you know, for me, you class. know, it's age class mm -hmm. of animal. And so I, and I know that's what I'm there to do. And, um, the remorse for me is like when the, the excitement of the situation or like the, the buck fever essentially gets to a point where, you know, I've killed a deer that was not what I set out to do. Mm -hmm. And it, this is a complex, this is a complex situation. It's harder it's hard, than it's harder than it's it hard for people to understand because the fact that I have remorse in, in killing that animal does not mean that it deserves any less respect. No. you know that than the goal than the animal i was chasing like it, it it's a, still a living creature and for that reason i'm just i almost disgusted with myself even more to this like man not only did i not accomplish my goal i took a life of something that you know i, I it wasn't what i set out to do and that's hard and so wh what's interesting is that in a group environment of of hunters and so, and I'll, so Willie is, Uncle Willie is mm -hmm. a good friend in our hunting. He's coming from the UP, you know, he, he's got a lot of years on me too. And, and so, uh, you know, he's very much of the opinion that like, man, you should never, you, basically the way he'll state it is you should never feel bad about shooting a, a deer. Every deer is a trophy. And we disagree on that mm -hmm. be, because I, I, while I agree every deer that's deserves killed deserves respect, respect I also support somebody being disappointed with themselves for not accomplishing grow. their goal. That's how you grow. As a, as I think a, it's okay. Anything. I think it's okay that, you know, if, if you're like, man, I'm going to Kansas this year, I, you know, I've killed a bunch of, you know, three-year-old bucks. My goal is to, whether it's a specific animal or, or this specific age class, and if you shoot something that's less than that, it's not my place to say, oh, dude, you shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. But if you're disappointed with yourself, you know, having said, man, I set out to do this and I, you know, my excitement got the best of me or whatever. I just, the situation, I decided to do this. Yeah. Man, it's a, it's a complex situation because well, it's okay for me, I think, to say, man, it's, I understand why you're disappointed. You know, it's. And Jake, I think you kind of, in your evolution, got the vice versa, which was you started to evolve to say, you know, I don't want to shoot one year olds or two year olds. I want to shoot three and older. And people probably looked at you like, What's wrong with you? Why why would you why would you pass all these one and two year old healthy deer and try to shoot a three year old? You know. Well, I absolutely I I can tell you um, everything from my close group 
uh, my family, we always got together on, on November 15th is uh, firearms opener here in Michigan. And that was always a big day, you know, uh, getting together, having lunch, you know, and I would say, oh, you know, I passed the such and such. No, I, you know, I let a nice buck go by this morning and they just look at me like I'm some sort of alien. Right. Okay? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Right. And some of my friends, I'd say, hey, you know, I, I took a picture of this buck instead of, instead of shooting it, you know, it's catch and release. I took a picture. This is the one I let go by this morning. And they're like, oh my God, I cannot believe you let that buck go by, you know? And I said, well, you know, it's just not what I want. And I, I'm, I'm good with letting it go. If somebody else uh, gets it good for them. Yeah, not on my list. And those group atmospheres, and, I'll I'll be the first to admit I've gotten pulled into them. Like on a note, when we used to do our deer camp, which was you know from the time I was nine till I don't know late twenties, um, you know that atmosphere around the first day of a firearm season, much like you're saying there, Jake, was so uh, intoxicating. Like it was so exciting. And and meanwhile, I had bow hunted all year, right? But th- there was just something great about being in a deer camp with. 15 guys and staying up the night before and like everybody's so excited let's go yeah everybody's so you know that i i shot plenty of Uh. one and two year olds during opening day of pennsylvania season that i had passed bigger deer during bow season and it was kind of like i almost confused myself i'm like why would i do but it was because like the the intoxication of that deer camp atmosphere was so strong it was like man i can't wait to go back to camp with this one-year-old seven point and yeah. I was I was super excited about no, it it's, until it's like later. A group think, you know, yeah. it's essentially you get in a group of guys who are all, you know, you, you feel that pressure to be like, I'm gonna show off, or uh, you know, that's I'm I'm in a good company here to do this, even yeah. though I wouldn't normally like, by we myself. We all want to kill a big bu- uh, buck tomorrow, and yeah. it's like, cool, yeah, I shot one, and then I'm like, I I passed seven bucks bigger than this during bow season, you know, and it, I didn't have an explanation <laughs> for it. And that's, I mean, dude, that's okay. I think, like, you know, ultimately. It's okay to, you know, see, this is where it gets tough. Like in my group, I've had to kind of acknowledge our dynamic and say, okay, listen, it's going to be really difficult for me to achieve my, my personal goal in in deer hunting amongst, you know, just the dynamic that we have here. And so rather than forcing other people to change the way that they want to hunt or, you know, I've essentially gone off and, and gotten more permission, more, you know, more access to property to be able to, to, to do it and also take advantage of the opportunity that our group offers. Well, that's, that's a good solution because it can bring up, you know, uh, some pretty uh, spirited debates. A hundred percent. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, well, I mean, we're passionate guys. Everybody wants to do oh, it, yeah. do something different, yeah. do it our way, you know? And, you know, anytime you get a group of people together, it's, it's difficult to get uh, total agreement on anything. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the group hunting camp, uh, that's, that's just incredible uh, nostalgia that's gone yes. on. It's carried on for, you know, decades in the hunting world and it will continue, you know, mm-hmm. but I do, I do see a change and, and, and I think it's a good change. You know, I, I think everybody that, uh, uh, reaches a goal and then strives for the higher goal. And, and especially our, our younger hunters seem to be much more willing to, uh, you know, say, yeah, I want to shoot, you know, 130. I want to shoot a Pope and young. Uh, I'm going to pass everything underneath. They may not be very good at, at, uh, identifying age class. They could have a four-year-old in front of them. That's 122 inches. And they go, well, you know, he's not Pope and young. I'll let him go. Yeah. But irregardless, I, I see, I see that younger group that's going to, uh, replace these older hunters that you know eventually are unable to hunt or pass away uh and and it ultimately i think is going to make the uh, whitetail population a better population with more fun for everybody to hunt well, well, you know because everyone wants to see a nice buck right i mean for I've, sure i have not had one client hire me that says oh no i don't want to kill any big bucks yeah okay? you know, and <laughs> no that's what i'm saying me. like <laughs> e- even you know we we get a lot of people that purely hunt public land listening to this and and a lot of times you know whether they do it for the challenge or whatever it might be you know the fact is like it doesn't matter where you hunt like nobody in their right mind will say well i i don't want to kill a big buck i mean that maybe that's yeah. not the realistic goal for all of us but everybody that walks and in, steps into a stand the thing that they're dreaming of is a giant buck walking out in front of them in bow range or gun range or whatever it is it's, I'm still in my mind trying to pinpoint what that is. Like, I, I know you could point to times in history, like 
you know, the Pope and Young Club, the Boone and Crockett Club, the Deer Like, what is, is it just in our nature that we want to kill the biggest, oldest, highest scoring thing? Like, is it, maybe how, how as, deep is it in our yeah, DNA? Yeah, maybe it's as primitive as, like, you know, we want to take the It always the has been, too. Like, I mean, dude, look, animal. look back, read back, like, whale yeah. hunting story. It's like, man, for as long as... Captain Ahab, one man, of the massive white Mankind has existed. Yeah. It's like, we've wanted to, to hunt the biggest, oldest, most mature thing. Like, that's just in human nature, it seems. Yeah, I would agree. You know, it's like the big fish story. Yeah. You know? That's right? exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. We just always want to do better and outdo the other guy. You know. Well, <laughs> and that's it. That said, it's not like, like I think I, it's just human nature. If I go you know? trout fishing, it's not like I'm not <laughs> trying to catch the the ten inch rainbow trout or ten inch brown trout or something. Like I'm catch whatever I catch, you know. But if I catch a twenty inch, it's like that. Yeah. You know, that's the ultimate goal. Like, and that's why? Goal. And yeah. Why are we intrigued by that? That's so interesting. Yeah. I think it's the inner competition. Ego. I mean, we, we talk yeah. about it a lot. From um, you know, I always relate it back to like sports careers and stuff, like. It, there's a there's an inner competition that when you're part of a team sport or whatever like that or or even individual sports you have competition against other individuals or other teams i think as you you know even if you part ways from that or even if you never were in sports inside all of us is some inner competition to be better and i don't mean this in a disrespectful way but anybody who has no drive to to be better inside of themselves Frankly, it shows, and and you see those people in society. It will show in other per, yeah, parts of your life. Other parts of your life. Yep. You know. Well, yeah, that's well said. Agree, a hundred percent. And it's 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 kind of hard to say that to people, and and I I say that now, especially because in society, in today's society, I think you see that lack of drive to be better more than ever. Like yeah. there are easily i can look wow. at a person and say i'm sorry it's that self-love concept dude it's it's like hey you don't have you're perfect the way you are it's like no you're fat and lazy like you yeah <laughs> you know work harder and, and improve yourself well yeah or you know you didn't get the promotion yeah. that you wanted work harder work harder. don't don't sulk in the corner nobody's yeah. going to give you anything for that and and that mindset has been driven deeper well, into communities for the last what 10 years 15 years that's your uh participation trophy mindset as well. 100%. Yeah. It is. Yeah, everybody gets a trophy. It yeah. is. And and I, I think you. that, you know, as hunters, I agree, there is something more primitive to the kill the biggest thing. I'm, ju yeah, I'm just is. imagining myself as a part of like a, like an Indian, like you want to be the one to come back to the tribe and be like, I killed, yeah. I got the biggest I one. Got the biggest something one. very primal yeah. about it. You know, and, and even if you look at some of those things, like if you look at any of like the old uh, like murals and stuff that Native Americans did on cave walls, they're all and big stuff, bucks. Yeah, none of them Very are none does. of them are a button buck <laughs> or a doe. Like they're all they're all oh, big yeah. antlers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's there is that that sense of it, but I also think because we we are all smart enough to know that sustainably. If we continue to harvest the older, more mature, that there is a new class, a new generation mm. of animals coming in to sustainably continue that species. That's interesting. You know, and so if we, and I mean, at one point, and Jake, you may know what Michigan's was, you know, at one point, Pennsylvania was like 92% one-year-old bucks in the harvest annually. You know, I assume oh, Michigan was probably very similar. Yeah, we were, we were there and, and we still are higher than I like. I think sure. we're like. 68 percent yeah yeah but so if you and think that, about that you yeah, know yeah. that's a large portion of of a you know a young called co cohort or generation you know being removed out of the population and very few being able to move on you know as we start to flip that thing which frankly going from 90 plus to 68 did think about how many then deer go into the two-year-old age class now it doesn't matter the quality of a hunter you are most hunters are now seeing quote bigger bucks just because they got pushed to the next age class. Yeah. Well, I've, I've heard a couple of deer biologists use the analogy, you know, imagine if the human race, if you eliminated all your 14 to 18 year olds, yeah. 60, 70, 80% of them, what would the human race be like? Okay. And, Wild. and the mistakes that would be made because you wouldn't have the, the older, wiser experienced, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're a lot different socially and communicate different, but, uh, it is really, uh, cool, uh, to look back now to see how many more, you know, two and three year olds 
that are not only, you know, on properties, uh, you know, the one I own and uh, properties I manage, but just throughout Michigan. I mean, I drive around today, you know, this time of the year, you guys mentioned you know, oh, September yeah. 1st, these last couple of weeks, I drive somewhere early in the morning or, or just before dark and look out in these bean fields. I see bucks on other people's properties. I don't even know who owns them. It's like, man, look at that nice buck out there. Look yeah. at that group of bachelors out there. You just did not see that 25 years ago, yeah. you know? So, so yeah, it, that part's great. I, I think it's super yeah. interesting how the landscape has changed from maybe the, the time that you were a, like a boy, Jake, or a young man to like now, you know, Jeremy's got kids that are, like what seven and eleven? Ten and six. Ten and six. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the gas station. Yeah. Seven <laughs> and uh, you know, not not to to downplay like what goes into it, but like I'm saying, compared to 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 Jake's early years there, it's very doable. You know, to kill a uh, let's call it a two so doable that it scares and, me, an frankly. antlered buck. You know, and that's come with a lot of things that we've talked about here technology weapon improvements the state of the deer herd itself mm -hmm. um just, just all of these things culminating and now like you go out with your boys expecting to see an antler deer at the very least for sure well and that's what that i guess frightens me a little bit like i know how excited i was as a 12 year old or e even before i was able to hunt you know, to go out and hunt with my dad and then as a 12 year old to like see my first you know buck and my first year was a was a button buck as well and you know now you know my kids see antler deer very regularly just in normal everyday life to the point when we were hunting you know so uh my oldest killed a buck two years ago four point last year my youngest killed a four point and last year, my oldest, like a, a button buck came into the food plot and I was like, Hey, you know, you shoot that deer. He's like, well, oh, is that a button buck? I was like, yeah. And he's like, no, I'm not going to shoot it. When I was his age, I would have dropped that thing in a heartbeat. <laughs> like I wouldn't even have hesitated. And, and, I, and so that's what worries me is like, you know, and no offense to if anyone's listening to this, I've seen kids their age, 10 and six killing 150 plus inch bucks. Like I'm still chasing 150 inch bucks, you know? And so it, it it worries me a little bit for that generation coming up to say, you know, how quickly are they going to get bored with hunting? Because out of the gate, some of our most pinnacle uh, goals and excitements are so attainable. easily attainable in their age class right now, in their 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 generation, well, and even to the point where we're resisting. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just throw out some things there that have made deer hunting easier, like. Uh, even put compound bows in the compound realm, and bows. I'm curious to hear Jake's opinion of when those were introduced. Cell cameras. For sure, cell cameras, blinds, baiting, private land, you name it. Anything that goes into making killing deer easier, mm -hmm. you know, those things seem just qu qu quite a bit more evolved than where they were. And it seems normal for my kids, where Jake growing up or my gr me growing up or you growing up, like, those things were evolving, like— I I argued a little bit with somebody on YouTube earlier because we got into the crossbows discussion, which I'm not going to pick on. But the fact was, like, you know, I think that crossbows for youth are are great. I think it's a great entry point for me to get them into bow <clears throat> season, that they can hunt longer, they can be more experienced, we can get deer closer. Um, but when I grew up, when I was 12, no, I didn't even know what a crossbow was. Didn't even hear about it. You know, it wasn't, wasn't even a possible thing for me to use at 12, which means I didn't hunt you know, with my compound till I think I was 13. But for my kids who are six and 10, I want them to use the crossbow because they can't lethally kill something with a compound. And I want them to be out there and experiencing the entire bow season, not waiting two months till a seven day or 10 day gun season happens. So that evolution in, in new devices and new technologies in that way has been good, I think. But because of the way the deer herd is now, it's like, Man, like they pretty much expect to tag a buck every year, you know, it, just because it seems very, very attainable to them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's a good opinion. Yeah, I don't know. And it, it may not be the right opinion, Jake. You know, I, I just uh, what I want my kids in this generation to feel is probably what you felt in the, the 60s and 70s, what I felt in the, the 90s, um, which was like you couldn't get me out of the woods. You couldn't get me out of the woods. I mean, it's just, yeah. that's yep. just where I wanted to be. 
But to your point, with all the new technology, Jared, it's it's tough because, frankly, they don't need to go to the woods. Well, <laughs> it's it's hard. Be- <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead, Jake. No, I, you know, um, the chase is is an essential part of what makes us hunters. Yes. And I think, you know, looking at the youth and uh, the youth seasons. Uh, the, the technology of equipment, a lot of times the chase is very short or almost non-existent. You know, dad's done the scouting. He's got a box blind set up. He's worked on the food plot all summer long. He brings the 12 year old girl or boy, you know, it's uh, it's 7 p.m. an hour before dark. Guess who shows up like clockwork in the middle right. of September at the youth hunt? You right. Know? This is the big buck that dad's been watching on cell camera all yep. season long. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but I mean that there is a lot to be said about working so hard just to see an antler deer and working, you know, making all the mistakes and drawing your bow at the wrong time and not getting the shot Mm -hmm. or missing. And all those things you went through as, as a young individual getting to where I am today. Okay. And uh, I kind of agree with what Jeremy said, you know, your, your, your goal for your kids is to experience all that. So I wonder if it's kind of anticlimactic. Um, I may, uh, uh, an official scorer for the organization here in Michigan called Commemorative Bucks of Michigan. Okay. And I get a chance to score a lot of different deer and turkeys and some bear and elk once in a while. And I do have these, these youth hunters come in with these, you know, 165, 178 inch grow spoon and Crockett bucks at, you know, first deer. And it's like, wow, you know, where do you go? And I, sometimes I joke with the dad. I say, well, he might as well quit hunting. I say the same thing, Jake. And, and, and it, you know, and I'm glad my kids shot one year old four points for their first bucks. Right. You know, but that said, like we're going out. So I, I've got a farm in Kentucky. We're going out to, for Kentucky's opening day, which is this Saturday, September 3rd. And yeah. they both will hunt and they will have a le- legitimate chance at killing multiple four-year-olds. I mean, there, there are mar- wow. multiple four-year-old bucks on those, in those areas You know, and so I kind of hope that the dumb two-year-old seven-point or eight-point shows up simply because if they shoot one of these 140-plus-inch four-year-olds, it's kind of like, well, man, where do I go from here with them? Like, I know that they're still going to hunt, and I know they'll still be intrigued, but, man, there's something about, like you said, you got that box of one- and two-year-olds that, you know, skull plates and stuff that eventually you're like, man, I really would like to kill a bigger buck than this. Like, that, that... you know, progression, that evolution, that, that desire to do better, you know, if you do better the first time out, are you still passionate yeah. about it? Are you still hooked? Like that, that's what worries me about this next generation coming up. Well, um, you know, and, and those are good concerns. I mean, I think whatever it takes to keep youth interested in hunting, uh, I don't know the ingredient on that because they have so many external, uh, mm-hmm you know, influences trying to pull them away from hunting. And, and you know, these poor kids, they, they go into a, a lot of typical school systems, try to convince them that hunting is bad. And sure. I don't, want to, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But uh, one thing is, you know, that that when, when you guys included, when we were younger and we first started hunting, there were not 140 inch deer that were ever going to walk out. Yeah, no. They just didn't exist. Doesn't okay? mean so that we, we were, didn't dream about it, right? I nope, mean, the, the, the we, mindset we was like, maybe, maybe, you know, but you it, know. It, they, they didn't exist. They weren't there. They just didn't exist. So, you know, when that one and two year old showed up, man, you know, that was, that was the top of the, of the, you know, yep. 10 or 15% of what was available in the areas we were hunting. We were pretty darn proud and, and, and happy with achieving that, you know, that the challenge it took to get that two year old. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't know, you know, what kind of implication it will have, you know, it, it will happen after I'm uh, in the ground several years to, you know, our future hunters 50 years from now, mm-hmm. having been able to experience multiple places to go where there are 140 inch deer. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm hoping Michigan someday becomes that state. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that they will, you know, the, I, I'm really hoping it does. The, the one thing that I think I would be curious, Jake, and, and maybe this ties back into kind of that break point that you had where you said, you know, eh, I, I kind of want to kill three, three year old and older deer, you know, obviously the technology we have now with cell cameras and stuff didn't exist, you know, major, you know, maybe film trail cameras were just starting to come out in the eighties the timeframe and stuff. But 
you yeah. know, the, the thing that I think Jared and I have even struggled with, you know, and, and we try to get as much recent information as possible from our cameras or infield scouting is, you know, there are definitely times that your goal simply isn't attainable. Like if I said, I want to kill a five and a half year old buck in Pennsylvania this year, that may not be attainable because there isn't a five and a half year old buck in the area that I'm hunting. So I guess when you started to make that decision, I'm sure there was some non-confidence happening of like, man, can I actually do this? But, but at what point did you actually feel like you were sitting in the stand and this is an attainable goal? Um, I, you, like in, you know, when you say at what point, um, you know, uh, year wise or evolution in my hunting. I, I think it's like what Jeremy's saying is like to, to be able to set a goal, there's usually some shred of evidence that it's possible. Yeah, that it's, it's, like a, that that three and yeah. a half year old buck existed in Michigan yeah, maybe that you were going to A sighting hunt. or, yeah. you know, some sign that led you to believe that, hey, maybe I can, maybe I can do this, whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say um, for myself in that about 15 years ago, okay, with the work I had done on the property and the confidence I had in uh, bucks that I call homeboys. Okay. Yep. They're, 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 this is their core area. Uh, they've survived uh, two or three Michigan firearm seasons, and they know where they can live. Got it. And, uh, and so I'm actively passing these bucks and letting them get older. And so I'm going into the tree stand with all the confidence in the world. And I'm a big believer in that, you know, which would be a whole nother conversation about, you know, the mindset you have going into that stand is going to have so much to do with how your success plays out. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go in there negative with, I'm never going to see anything other than a year and a half, that's pretty much what you're going to see. Yeah. That doesn't mean all the time, but I, I would say, you know, 15 years plus I've actively believed that not only would I see a four year, you have an opportunity to see a four year old, I could see something possibly older. Interesting. And we're just, from from your tool standpoint, is that based on observation data? Is it based on finding sign? Were you using trail cameras to like actually see that deer in existence in the area? Yeah, it was a combination of all those things. Okay. You know, uh, trail trail cameras, visual sightings, and, and deer that I knew were around. Okay, Got it. Based on you know a sign they were leaving and things like that. Yeah, just the you know, the amount of buck competition I was having on the property. And I knew there was an awful lot of dynamics going on here. Very cool. Hope, hope that answers that. Yeah, no, it does. It, 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 because, you know, I think there's a lot of people listening to this. We're approaching the opening day for many states, probably by the time this comes out, Nick, what, mid-September? Okay, so let's say, you know, that, you know, end of September, October 1st time frame, a lot of states are opening up their bow season. There's a lot of people listening to this who said, you know what? I want to kill for a four and a half or older buck this, this bow season. That is my goal. Unless they have that on camera or they've seen it in person, which is very unlikely. Um, how do, you know, they can have that goal, but the confidence of attaining that goal, frankly, may be unrealistic. Like there literally might not be a four and a half year old buck in the area that they're hunting. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, that probably has a huge factor in deciding to hold out for a four-year-old or older. Um, I, I think cell cameras have really changed every, everything from hunting and, and scouting yeah. and, and knowing what you have on the property. But as we all know, anybody who's used uh, any camera, cell camera or non-cell camera, you don't get a photograph of every mature buck right. in the area. So you've yeah. got the strangers. So when you go back to my business, I'm a big believer that if you've got the proper ingredients of the habitats, you will attract the the oldest and best quality deer to this pro to that property. Okay, got it. And and so you know, knowing that I may not have him on camera, but I'm willing to wait for <clears throat> excuse me, wait for like a stranger. A lot of people refer to a stranger deer. Never had him on camera. Yeah. Never saw him go out there. It's November 2nd. I hear a grunt. I look, here he comes, you know, make the perfect 25 yard shot. And here's this monster buck. I don't know where he came from, but now he's dead on the ground. Well, as a hunter, you're pretty happy with that. And so Jake, are you saying in the, in the, those cases, if you know that you've set your farm up with the right habitat, with the right conditions, um, that you do have a confidence that that quote stranger buck of a good caliber 
is going to show up. Yeah, 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 I do. Interesting. And, and I will say what I tie that into, and I'd say probably the last 10 years of my habitat management, I've, I've really focused on not only getting all those key elements of a habitat set up right, but then understanding the conditions to hunt them because there are specific conditions that these mature deer move in. Mm-hmm. And I've spent probably 30 years taking notes, observation notes and, and, and logging information to kind of, uh, <clears throat> I got it a lot closer now. I'm not going to say I have it perfect because white tails are still white tails and you're still going to get the, the oddball that does the darndest thing that's unpredictable. And then you're going to have the, the one that's, yeah. pretty much where he should be when he should be you know i i agree with what you said there dick you mentioned cell cameras specifically but I, but i would say just trail cameras in general there's a lot you know there's negative things we can say about them now in terms of patterning or overuse or, or whatever it is but it's i think it's undeniable that they were one of the greatest conservation tools like ever introduced or made available to hunters and that prior to using them um outside of sightings you know whether it's the spotlighting or in you know in the field encounters you know trail cameras are the 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 only tool that we have that confirms you know the the deer that are using an area Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's a buck to do ratio it's literally the thing that says okay yeah he's there this this buck exists exists. Mm -hmm. and without without that what information do you have to go off of to say, like you're saying, I'm going to pass two and three year old deer or, or whatever, uh, that gives you the concrete evidence that you should need to say, okay, he exists. This, well, yeah. this goal is, is it's at least feasible. No like, different than the specific buck. Like if I was watching a specific buck and I have yeah. done this last year and I haven't seen him yet this year, do I pass these other bucks that would meet my criteria? for the chance that he did make it through and he will show up again most of us listening to this have sat in a stand and felt like we were hunting a ghost before just because like (laughs) it seems like that deer is never going to show and maybe he's alive maybe he's not like that that becomes the the inner competition for yourself of are you comfortable enough basically eating your tag for the year to wait for him to show up or are you going to shoot a buck that maybe isn't the one that you're after and and you know there's nothing wrong with that it's just at some point you have to just come to peace with yourself of yeah you know what i'm okay if i don't tag anything this year for the chance that he shows up i've been there i i bet all of us have been there um but it, it's it's a lot harder than it sounds because that other buck walks by and do you have the self restraint to not shoot it oh yeah that's you know, that's from individual to individual. <laughs> uh, some of my clients that I talk with, you know, I go, you know, if you want to go go down this road of, you know, four and a half or specific deer, you know, it's it's not for the lighthearted. It is not. You, you really do have to have some good discipline and understand, you know, how important it is to reach your goals and, yeah, uh, you know, letting that really nice deer go by and then not having any remorse if you let him go by because God darn it, I'm holding out for you know, whatever the buck is that, yep. that, you know, some people nickname them, some, you know, some just know which one it is, but, um, I, I, will I do s- believe that the, the trail cameras really did change. Yes. I think hunters in being able to do what you just mentioned, holding out, you know, they have positive proof. They may only be Open getting their eyes to the pictures of that buck, mm-hmm. but now they know that buck exists. Yeah. Okay? Well, and, I th- and there's a lot to be said about that. 100%. I think that's what helps in groups like yours or these other groups that what, maybe these people yeah, aren't They're like, it's not to- possible. We could never do that. Here I'm like, is. look, here's the picture. Here's the proof. Here they are. Yeah, they're here. They are out there. They're living creatures walking around the woods that you can yeah. shoot. Like, and before that, it was kind of like, well, don't shoot that buck because a bigger one will come by. Well, it's a pipe dream. It's a, yeah, we didn't yeah, know. It's a, maybe, yeah. I don't know. Who knows what's out yeah, there? Yeah, maybe they exist. And and listen, I, I will be the first to say that I do miss some of that element of surprise. There's no doubt. Like to, to go in an area, like if I read sign, like if I read a, a you know, a giant, uh, you know, scrape and then here's the rub line and everything like that. That element of, I don't know what that deer is. Like, he, I mean, maybe well, it's a giant, do, maybe it's not. Do you know what offers that now, though, is like in what Jake is saying about the habitat on his place and his just knowledge of the area, 
those those types of areas that's still possible you know yep. like that's why we go out of you know we go to Kansas mm-hmm. and, and you know we hope to draw in Iowa someday um, and, and it's not that it's a guarantee by any means but we we just know that these areas permit deer to get to a certain age class which get yep. them to a certain antler class that we're interested in you can do that still you can go out you can read the sign yep. you can you can kind of expect that the class of animal that you're chasing is is there and we're all in agreement that you know, although cameras are amazing, it still doesn't capture a hundred percent of the bucks Definitely that are out not. there. You know, no. and, 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 and frankly, I'll, we've talked about this before. I'm the first to say that I often will over hunt cell cameras, meaning I wait and wait and well, wait and I miss opportunities. Let's, let's clarify, let's clarify the statement. I think that when it comes to inventorying deer, 90, 99% of them, I, you can get them on camera, especially if you can dump a corn pile, but uh, when it comes to to hunting and patterning, I do think that it is a very limited window of what's actually happening. Yeah, and when you finally see it on camera, you're too late. Like if if you're right. waiting for a buck to come through a certain pinch point, and then you get them on camera in that pinch point. So there's two kind of conversations. It's there's inventorying where I think it's very very effective. Maybe it's not 99, but whatever it is. High. And there's patterning, which I think it's significantly less effective. I think, but we, still more effective than not having. Yeah, I think either. we. I think a lot of us have an overconfidence yeah. in the ability to pattern a deer via a cell camera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I, you know, there's a part of me. Um, I've told people this. Um, I am never the kind of hunter that would get a uh, a picture on my phone and see a buck is in a certain area. And go, oh, I'm going to drop everything I'm doing and grab my stuff and get out there right now because he's right there. I know I can go over by these scrapes, the winds sure. from this direction. He'll probably, you know, to me, that is ethically cu- uh, crossing a line yeah. that I just personally won't go. Mm, yeah, I still enjoy the hunt. And I like the element of surprise that you guys just were yeah. talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, <clears throat> and they're good for that information. Again, like confirmation he's still alive. Uh, confirmation yeah. there's a new buck in an area. Confirmation that the first doe might be an estrus. Like. There are things yeah. like that that they are are great for. Just even today, we're finding out they're you know shedding velvet. Yeah, I mean they're it, yeah. One of the reasons we probably aren't seeing some of our deer is because they're actively shedding and they get squirrely oh, yeah. this time of year. Yep. You know, so yeah, I think that there are great things. You know, what for that means it. there's rubs on trees. Oh, <laughs> right, I know, right? Right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it, it it is a cool thing to use. Um, and I, and I worry because of the technology that you know some of our younger generation <clears throat> is used to that frankly they will rely 99% on cell cameras at some point they they'll just that's what they'll use they won't scout they'll they'll put cell cameras out and they'll watch their cameras and eventually that's how they'll hunt it the I don't think so I think there's a large portion of them that will I think we are we, you and I are in the generation that's realizing hey some of this stuff you know and Jake has seen too with cell hey it's it's good. It's taking the fun out of it at some point. You know, the surprise, the whatever. It's it's making it too easy. And and who wants that? You know, and so I think at some point there is a pulling back of the reins to say, like, well, yeah, we can do that. I can also go out. I mean, that's why I think a lot of the states are doing it is because I don't think they believe the hunters have enough self-restriction to pull back. So they're just saying no more trail cameras now. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't. Well, know. and that's an interesting dynamic, too. You can talk about state restrictions versus Sure. self-imposed um maybe for another time but um, yeah. yeah yeah and i have my you know just to let you know i have my own self-imposed restrictions when it comes to trail cameras yep and i'm uh, uh late you know, labor day weekend is coming and that is my that's when i pull all my cameras out of the woods in the bedding areas oh interesting i pull them out because i just have enough evidence to know that cameras in bedding areas affect deer movement interesting huh. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Stealth Cam. Dude, where would we be without our cell cams? I would definitely be divorced at this point. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I mean, the fact is, is I spent more time checking cameras than I actually did hunting prior to cell cameras. Now, at least my wife can enjoy me being in the comfort of my own home, buried in my phone, checking those pictures. Yeah, 100%. And dude, when it comes to uh, trail cameras and definitely cell cameras, reliability is, I think, the number one thing that we're looking for. Stealth Cam just has a long reputation of reliable cameras, and ultimately that is the most important thing to us. They have to work. In terms of reliability, there's not a better camera on the market than Stealth Cam, whether you're talking about the Fusion X, the Reactor, or the DS4K Transmit. And most of them are under 200 bucks. StealthCam.com. Check them out.
Pretty See, we go to the bathroom and we get into a crossbow <laughs> argument just like that, you know? And so it's, it's inevitable to, to like, We're, come on. Or we catch a lot of flack for, because we, cro- we have conversation about cross you know crossbow seasons and crossbows and archery seasons. and i don't know if we want to talk about it or not but so if you walk that back at one time i think the same conversation happened around compound bows being imposed on a uh, yeah, previously re- traditional bow season correct and uh which people uh, there's no argument that people would say compound bows are easier to use than a long bow or a recurve easier bow. to use more effective that's the whole point. A hundred percent. They are they are two traditional bows. What compound? What crossbows are to compound bows? Yes. You know, m- maybe with some differences, but it's a very it's a fair argument. Again, why my six year old is using a crossbow is because it's easier for him and it, he can be more lethal with it than a compound bow. I, I don't know if this will make it into the podcast here or not, Jake. <laughs> but but what what was what was like the what was the mindset amongst bow hunters like when compound bows initially were getting introduced to archery to archery i would tell you it was full of all the emotion that uh, revolves around crossbows today i would imagine um the diehard bow hunters are like what are you doing that's making it too easy yeah It it was the same thing yeah making it too easy it was too accurate it's not that different from a gun they were using the same exact statements then was it was it allowed right away? Like, was there legislation that needed to happen to say, "Hey, compound bows can be used during this traditional archery season"? Or? Um, no, no, at least at least not here in Michigan. I mean, when they first came out, you know, there were um, a lot of us uh, traditional hunters. You know, I, I hunted with you know rear curves, and and we were like, "Oh, you know, uh, it's more accurate." You know, right? How how awesome! It gives me a better opportunity. Some people would would say extend your range, but I wouldn't really say that because, you sure. know, uh, range is all about accuracy and your ability to uh, anticipate yeah. that you're going to move or not, you know. So, uh, but yeah, there was, there was no, to my knowledge, nothing happened here in this state that said, oh, you can't use compound bows. Like it, now, it, whether, yeah. now, whether it had to be introduced uh, from a legislative standpoint through the, uh, the, the hunting laws that they were legal, that might, that may have had had to happen i don't know yeah um, i you know it's was, it was sort of like tree stands you know when i was first bow hunting mm. tree stands were not allowed in michigan so you were on the ground interesting i did not so know my that. first my first few bucks were i was on the ground because tree stands were not allowed wow. and then they allowed tree stands for archery and would not allow tree stands for firearms hmm. and i believe it was around 1998 or in that time period when tree stands were allowed here in Michigan for firearm season. So we were a slow state to move wow. a lot of those. It, I mean, it um, is amazing as you hear so, those kind of progressions. And like you said, you, you know, back then it was the same things being said, the same tension that was, that was occurring mm-hmm. when compounds were entered as they were with, with crossbows. And, you know, one could argue, and I'm sure their stats exist to say, Hey, if you look at the year's, right after compounds were put in there were more deer killed during archery season just like when you look at the 100%. years following crossbows i'm dude, i'm super more... open to that argument i really am yeah i mean it, yeah. it it's progression it's a evolution it well, it's an enhancement it, it, again none this is never black and white but like for me and see this is where it's tough because i don't want to tell somebody how they can or can't hunt but you know, the, the cell camera conversation that we're having, I think, is very applicable to, to the compound situation. Yes. You know, you and I having achieved some, you know, some uh, whatever uh, success mm-hmm. in hunting, you know, look at it and say, well, I don't want, you know, and it's, it's tough because it's a personal decision. <laughs> it's like, I don't want it to be easy. that easy. I don't want it to, yeah, or easy, period. And so, like, we, we try to, restrict ourselves like and i understand why people are defensive of that that that, that we keep saying we want to make it harder and harder and they're like listen i already hunt public it's hard enough there's 15 guys around me that i can see when i'm in there you know if i see a buck older than two years old like i'm lucky like it's already hard like why do you guys want to keep making it harder on me I, I get that argument 100%. And frankly, I don't want to make it harder on those kind of people because sure. it is it is already hard. Sure. It's, um, and it's tough from to say 
from somebody in like I would say we're in a privileged position mm -hmm. to have access to land, you know, to have we can f f financially afford compound bows or you know what whatever it is that mm -hmm. gives us a high ground is like it's hard for us to to say like hey you can't do that thing that makes it easier for you sure and so i i mean i'm super i i sympathize with the I, argument i think ultimately i don't if it's legal do it i don't care i don't care if you use a crossbow i don't care if you bait i don't care if you do well any when of that you say stuff. that though in my mind the but wait i i got it, it shifts towards the the state it's, it's well, not that's the what i was gonna say yeah i don't have a problem with it as long as the state can provide me data that says that it is not detrimental to the herd the populations the age structure dynamics etc somebody dropped a comment i don't know if it's accurate or not but they're basically saying in pennsylvania now during archery season there are more deer killed with a crossbow than with a compound bow sure that's I, definitely true. I'm not in favor of that. I'm not it's either. It's gone too far at that point. Well, and listen, to take it a step further, so we get comments on our stuff all the time saying, hey, we're dividing hunters by having the conversation about, <laughs> and my opinion is very much that, listen, the division happened when the state allowed for crossbows to be considered archery equipment. The fact that we're talking about it, it's one of the reasons how we can that not be allowed? It's one of the reasons we have the podcast is we want to discuss the difficult things in the hunting community and cro it, there's probably no hotter subject right now in in archery than crossbows compound bows like that it, 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 it's just it's, and it's not the first time for what jake is saying you know this has happened before with compound the very but the very weapon that yeah. we're using you know yeah i you know uh just as a kind of segue you know michigan had and i know pennsylvania still has a, a primitive muzzle loader season yes. correct which Correct. is flintlock, patch and ball. And, yep. and you all remember, you know, 20 some years ago, the inline muzzle loaders. Yep. Okay. Correct. Um, put a, a 209 primer on the end. Sure, you still lo load it, but it's different and it pretty yep. much shoots like a 30 at six. Got a scope, scope on, on it. it. Yeah. And so there is just as much, and still to this day, division between the traditional muzzle loader guys and mm -hmm. the inline guys. 100%. Mm -hmm. So I think that, like, you know, when we you were talking about, you know, the, the goals to kill the bigger buck and the larger antler score it's it goes back to that human nature thing you know you're just going to have these differences of opinion mm -hmm. and uh, you know i mean where it's a slippery slope because once you start down that you know where does it end up you know now now they're proposing these air guns that have arrows in them. Okay. yeah can you imagine an air you know a co2 We've seen fired I've seen rifle yeah, yeah. with an arrow in it and they're pushing to get them legal well, in and I, and all those states that you and I hunt in. Yeah, so. and I mean, I I think when it ultimately comes down to it, again, I'm not opposed to anything that's that's legal and and, but at some point, and and this is this is kind of a knock on the states is most of the time they are two to three years at least behind on analyzing the data and telling me what happened. Right? We asked <laughs> we asked the game commission yeah. here about Sunday hunting and said, how many more deer are we killing because we have an extra Sunday in archery and an extra Sunday in rifle. They couldn't tell me. Couldn't tell nope. me. And it's like, well, when are you going to find out? Three years from now. What? Like, what if we are harvesting 25% more deer yeah. because of those Sundays? Should we not be able to counter that some way rather than waiting three years? Um, and, and this is the problem with landscape level management, right? And and Jake, this is why you have a business and 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 manage on a on a small farm level is because landscape level deer management does not work doesn't work the, their political boundaries they're they're judged on wildlife management units or county based stuff like it does not work doesn't work and so the only thing that i think has ever worked from a landscape level is the fact of states saying you now can't harvest a buck with less than three points per side or four points per side. There's still problems. It's still a flawed system because you're recruiting the less or the inferior deer into older age classes and making the better quality one-year-olds vulnerable to that antler restriction. But it at least got deer from age one to age two, which was a massive step in the right direction. It's uh, so anyways, that's I, a whole another can of worms, but. 
I think at the end yeah. of the day, dude, it, it always comes back to the fact that, like, you know, wow game in general, but we're talking about white-tailed deer. It, it's a it's a limited resource. Yes. You know, and if it wasn't, none of these issues would exist. I would say, great, crossbow, gun. Don't matter. F-15. Yeah, how, how whatever you want to do to kill deer on your property, but by all means, that's great. I want you to mm-hmm. have success, have, you know, do, hunt the way you want to hunt. But the reality is that it's a limited shared resource is that amongst, you know, that spirit of, Hey, I want you to hunt however you want to hunt and have, you know, who am I to tell you? Mm-hmm. Uh, but amongst that, you know, you have a limited resource that has no concept of property boundaries. And so in that sense, it's, it's a shared limited resource. And we're all trying to figure out how to get what we want out of the sport selfishly yep. and also give other people the freedom. And thirdly, maintain unity as like as sportsmen so that it's not taken away from us by by non-sportsmen well and the reason that the states are in control is because we as hunters and humans cannot self-impose restrictions on ourselves if the state tells me that i can shoot four does doesn't matter if my property can support that or not most people will shoot four does just Mm. how it is i don't know about that there's guys like us that understand that but there are a large chunk of the population that if somebody, if you lived in Missouri and you can shoot two bucks, you're going to try to shoot two bucks. Yes, but I also think that there's a lot of states that have uh, limits that are never met. I think like if a guy draws six doe tags, sure. he'll shoot two of them. I, I think that happens a lot. I would agree. Is that because he chooses to only shoot two or because of he couldn't find more than two? Uh, couldn't, couldn't find more than likely. But if, if they would have, if I heard of I mean, it didn't push the effort, it didn't, whatever. Yeah. Just I, didn't, just didn't happen. But I don't happens think that's all the, you know, who, t- who, you know, who told me that too was, uh, so in Ohio, the, the red tag, the farm sure. tags, they're like, listen, we, we dish these out all the time. Like it's candy. Here you go. Yeah. But people don't use them. And people don't use them. Yeah. Like gift cards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, because it's money, but worse. <laughs> it's money that you can only use in one place. I have to, gift yeah. cards are the worst gifts well, ever. Well, I mean, Missouri was one. and, and I know, cash. Uh, somebody corrected us a while ago. I know now they, they can only shoot two bucks. At one point, it was three. And it was like 0.007% of hunters killed three bucks in the state of Missouri. Like, yeah. it was super small. But that doesn't mean that people wouldn't try to kill three bucks, sure. right? It this The state level, the landscape level restriction... That is the the outer limits, and of course, you know whether it's fishing or whatever, people will exceed the bag limit. They will they will pass it at some point because they don't care for the law and they don't think regulations apply to them. I don't much care for the law, yeah. <laughs> but ultimately, I think it. You know, and I think Jake, this is probably where you know, and I, you know, dare we're, we're we getting me- heated here. Dare <laughs> we mention the name on here? You know, QDMA or the Quality Deer Management Association took a lot of crap for being involved with state level changes, whether it was antler restrictions, that was the main one, I would say, but even, you know, uh, concurrent buck doe and things like that. I mean, those guys pushed a lot of things out there and a lot of mindset out there that frankly was not well received from the state level hunters. I agree a hundred percent. And that doesn't mean that they they weren't, they 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 were were a well-founded organization that met with a lot of resistance. Yeah. Yeah. But there, there seems to be a, uh, a certain segment of hunters that are not, you know, I hate to use this term. Rush Limbaugh used to use this term, you know, the, the uninformed. Oh, yeah. Okay? But, you know, they go by all the, quote, wives' tales and rumors. And so they're like, who is this organization who's come out of nowhere to push this? I'm going to do what I want. Nobody tells me what to do. Right. Okay. You know, I'm going to hunt the way I want. And it always seems that's a very strong uh resistance uh you know which the state just loves they they just they rally that up because the state doesn't want to lose any control i mean you guys know how politics oh yeah sure it's it's money and money and power and control so if an outside organization like what now is the nda was qdma comes in with actually well researched biological reasons to uh push a you know to support a regulation the state is is 100 percent here in michigan the state's been against it mm-hmm. but number one wasn't their idea you know so so why would they want it you know and so it is too bad that that's 
that's happened because um, a lot of these uh, antler proposals and things like that were basically to, you know, satisfy a overwhelming majority of surveys and information that was taken of hunters that said they wanted this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. uh, <clears throat> this is the world we live in. I, th- I think it's interesting that, like, as we're talking at a, a landscape or a p- political level, like, undeniably, like, what's what's driven things like the QDMA and uh, I think political decisions is, or you know, at least for the past two or three decades, has it's is it, money in in part, you know, and so it just seems yeah. that you know people who are contributing to money, whether it's like t- to manufacturers or to Jeremy, you're going to have to help me clarify some, some of the how I word this because it's going to be wrong. But like a lot of what's turned deer hunting into to what it is today from a product level, from an industry level, from a legislation level ha- has been money, you know, paid by, uh, you know, sportsmen. And I think it's just by I don't know, it's just by coincidence that um, those people who are spending that money. Mm hmm. They want to kill the biggest bucks, and that seems to be, if you're going to point at that group and say that's a negative, they say they, these, this group of hunters, they only care about big bucks. They're locking up you're on the private land. You're saying that, like, the 1% who spends 80% of the money yes, in the industry is the ones who usually want to harvest the bigger deer. I think that's true. I believe, yeah. And what I'm also saying is that— I, But they're not the majority well, of hunters. They're and I'm the saying small sure, amount. Sure, but they're spending the majority of the money. Correct. That's why I'm saying money is the motivator. <clears throat> I think that 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 same group, knowingly or unknowingly, also wants the best for whitetail deer. Hundred percent. That that the the way that the, whether it's an antler restriction, we're in that group. The three of us we're are in, in that, that group. group. I absolutely, I would put myself in that group. They want to see a healthy age class of deer. I want to see a sustainable, a healthy, population. sustainable population. And the fact that that goes hand in hand with spending money on and targeting bigger, older bucks makes that group kind of an easy target to the rest of deer hunters and to society to say, look at this elitist group of... Well, I mean, I'll be the first to say, and I know that politically it's not right because of the way that the federal funding comes from Pittman, uh, the PR funds and and everything, is I said, since I was a teenager, uh, you could triple the license and I would still buy it just to get rid of the people that hunt one day a year. And I know that's not necessarily what people want to hear because we're decreasing, hunters are decreasing, da-da-da-da-da. Listen, I'll I'll make up the difference in the money myself to get rid of five people who cause the problems in the industry. (laughs) Well, dude, and like what you said right there (laughs) is what pisses people off. I know it does. And I can really sympathize with somebody. (laughs) Well, and dude, it comes back to this limited resource thing here because I really can sympathize with somebody who has just has hunted, you know, for me or for whatever. It's sure. just tradition. It's not fair to them. I know it's that not. somebody who is willing to spend more money and maybe has good intentions for That's the deer where herd, the elitist, mon- the elitist stereotype. It's comes not. From. It's not fair. At at the end of the day, I, that whoever's spending the money is the one that ultimately guides the decision. It's not fair. I co- I completely get it. It's not you know? fair. And it, and I've I've been one to said it in the past numerous times is that like you know somebody will say something and I'm like, "Well, you know, if if I paid 100 bucks for my license last year, I'll pay 300 this year. I'll still hunt and those two people won't." And I know that's not fair to say Sucks. that. Uh, yeah, it it absolutely is. but it's also because there are and it's not everybody, but there are people in that group who frankly take advantage of the resource, uh, give hunters a bad name. Like there is not an anti-hunter, non-hunter on this planet who cares about deer as much as I do. There isn't. Sure. Same with Jake. I guarantee it. Sure. There's not a, there's not a non-hunter or anti-hunter on this planet who's poured more dollars into whitetail deer than probably the three of us sitting at the on this podcast well and understandably is somebody who in that in that situation that we're sympathizing with are they going to say hey those guys care more about deer than me and they're spending the money no. on it, so good for it. And or I are they going to say to. f those guys they can't tell me what to do that's what they're going to say right. and, I, and i'm okay with that and and listen in the same breath don't tell me that you know, I'm an elitist because I have private land. Somebody commented, the, and now I'm going to go on a rant here. But somebody commented the other day and said something like, I can't believe that landowners would 
uh, take advantage of people wanting to hunt on their property and ask for money. Are you kidding me? That's their asset. They own land. Mm -hmm. If if you want that asset and you want access to the asset, guess what? You're going to pay for it. Well, <laughs> see, and I'm here. I'm the Robin Hood in this situation. I Because what Jake is saying about how he grew up hunting is the same thing that my uncle and dad would tell me. It's like, listen, back in the day, like we would just walk for miles. There was no post-it signs. It was like, it was awesome. You know, and it, again, I'll say it sucks that that, is not the case, you know, and, but the reality is all these things we've talked about, it is a limited resource. There is a market for them essentially in the form of this hunting industry that, uh, has, has taken that away from people. It, yeah. I don't know, Jake, anything to add there? Um, I think you covered it all. <laughs> Blanket us with, it, with wisdom you know, and experience. Well, oh. I, I, Jake, I guess we're, and I'm not to put you on the spot, but <clears throat> You're a private land consultant, right? You have a lot of people who own private land who really, really care about whitetail that pay you money to come out and consult. It, again, I'm not saying that they're any better than the guy who hunts one day public land Michigan opener for rifle season or gun season, but there's a level of involvement in a letter, level of um, investment, I should say, and that doesn't have to be money, it could just be time and resource, like energy, uh, into the whitetail habitat and herd that, frankly, the guy who hunts one day on public land will benefit from. And I think what separates, uh, what creates uh, this uh, perception of somewhat of an elitism from private landowners what gets missed is those are the same individuals that you guys made a comment earlier on the show about lazy people versus non-motivated people. Yeah. Well, I mean, you and your wife bought a piece of mm -hmm. land that you you openly said probably outpunted your coverage, right? But you yeah. made it work. How'd you make it work? I yeah. assume by busting your hump out there. Absolutely. Yeah, still uh, do. <laughs> well, and it's yeah. You know, in fairness, yeah. You know, we're making generalizations about landowners and non-landowners sure. there are lazy landowners a hundred percent yes whether they inherit yep. it or w whatever it is yep. uh, there also are super motivated non-landowners and Correct. so that's why i'm saying like in all this thing it, it's not fair you know but life is not fair well but but let me make this statement did maybe you're different because you had family but i would say that jake and i started as the motivated non-landowner mm -hmm. that's how i cut my teeth hunting public land, permission yep. land, knocking on doors, whatever. I mean, I did whatever I could to hunt and to be in the woods. That motivation of a non-landowner is what grew me to say, you know what? I'd like to have my own land. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what did it. Yeah. I was the same way. I wanted to have my own land. I wanted to control my own destiny, control how many people are hunting a, a given portion of a property. Mm-hmm. Uh, compared to what I ran into when I was, that, you know, knocking on doors and getting permission to yeah. hunt. That control that element up. is interesting that you mentioned there, Jake. I think we, we've talked a lot about human nature here. I think a yep. big part of, you know, and we've said it's primalism, the wanting to kill the biggest buck. Control is a, a huge factor, I think, in just us as men and also as bow hunters wanting to say, you know, I, I want to control. I want that deer to read the script. I want him to do exactly how I would I've manipulated this habitat. I want him to do that. And that's even, you know, and so I've caught myself saying like, man, in that sense, I would almost, I'd rather be good than lucky. You know what I mean? A hundred percent. I want to control the situation. And that's why it's so hard for us as, as bow hunters and land managers, I think at times to admit how much luck is involved in killing a big yeah. bug. It, because it certainly is a big factor. Oh, it's a huge factor. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's why, yeah. that's why when you see, uh, yeah, that's when you see somebody get lucky, you know, yep. you're happy for that person, but you're also like, oh, man, I, wor I worked so hard. I, you know, I did all the right things. Yeah. And it didn't happen. And it didn't you happen. Know, and, and, it and I mean, happen. and even yeah. to that back to our c big talk about evolution, listen, it, like I personally have done the public land thing. I've harvested bucks. I've gotten, you know, screwed on public land. That all led me to want private land. Now, yeah. given I still hunt some public land, but like I've, as evolution, as I've progressed in my hunting lifestyle, I've done all that. I mean, up until my late twenties, early thirties, I was hunting public land. That's all I was killing deer on. And I've progressed to where I've wanted now to where Jake was. I want to buy a piece of property. I want to mold that property. I want to control that property. Yeah. 
Uh, so I'm not saying that like out of the gate, you know, just go and get private land and that's the only way you're going to be a good deer hunter. All of those things in that evolution on public land have made me a better hunter. Well, and it doesn't stop there. I'm sorry, Jake. I know we're, we're kind of ranting here. It doesn't stop there either. And, and so, like you said, because, you know, I was, I'm fortunate, you know, my parents owned land and it's, uh, I, you know, I'm just fortunate to, to have be able to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. But I think it, I acknowledge that, you know what I mean? I realize that is the case. And, you know, while you guys have maybe had to go through some, some of that, those steps to acquire land that, that I haven't, um, I think that the next step there is wanting to, to share it with people for sure. Um, not in a way where it's just like, Oh, it's open, open for hunting. Yeah. But you know, you've, you guys have found satisfaction in that acquiring of land ownership, the, the understanding of how investing into it and managing a piece of property and a deer herd can ultimately, you know, yield satisfaction, uh, to share that with somebody and to get them to appreciate and, and also, uh, gain an understanding of that, like, like, this is what we're doing now with guys like Corey and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bringing new guys into our group is like, the, who wouldn't have access to that. That normally. is, that is ultimately where that leads. I think is I mean, being able to share it with yeah. other people. It literally is one of the earliest American dreams is to own a piece of land period. Like one of the earliest American dreams is to own a piece of land, Yeah, to claim a piece of land. And it's not easy, especially in today's society. Like Jake, I'm, I, you know, obviously times have changed, but, you know, that piece of land coming up back in the day that you were able to purchase, number one, how cool was it that it was so close to where you, you grew up, like your stomping grounds, um, you know, and that's probably what motivated you to buy that piece of land, I would assume. It, it was. Yep. Yeah, that's where I killed my first year. Yeah. And so to have that and to then, again, I, I'm not talking, you know, elitism or, or you know, the upper 1%, but to then call that piece of ground yours and now think how many years of, of effort have you put into that to make it better? Anybody around you, I don't care if it's private or public land has now benefited from your decades of investment into that piece of property because that shared resource, there's no fences, there's no, you know, boundaries that a deer care about ha have now benefited from. Oh yeah. Yep. The hard work that I do. I mean, you guys know about deer dispersal. Yeah. Okay? You know, buck dispersal. So I, I grow some really good, healthy does. They have fantastic, you know, button bucks that are, you know, by November, they're over a hundred pounds a piece. And, and if she stays alive, there's a pretty good chance they're going to disperse onto somebody else's property. And he's going to get the benefit of those incredibly healthy year and a half old bucks that, yep. that show up on, on their ground. So yeah, it go it it helps. It definitely uh, other people benefit, yeah, because of the work. You know, maybe the two year olds and some three year olds disperse as well. And yeah, it's it's all good though. We I all mean, benefit, man. It, it that I think know, at the end of the day, when when we hear the divide and and listen, uh, I get it. It's an anything. It's a tough conversation. It, it's always there, but ultimately, all of us, all of the effort, anything that you're doing is is trying to go to making this limited resource better. Um, and, and if you think differently, if you think that that's not the case, then, and I'm sure for a few bad apples there out there, it isn't the case. Um, you know, I think you're wrong. Uh, most 99% of people, whether it's a private landowner or public landowner or whatever are out there to try to make this limited resource better. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, I think a lot of landowners, uh, that are into the, you know, in, number one, into the deer uh, management, into land management, end up being clients of mine, hire me, you know, they want to leave the, the, they want to leave that ground much better than when they bought it. Sometimes hunters get thrown into a group of, take, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, of takers. <clears throat> and it, it, it's a fine line between that <clears throat> inside of, I say, I, I guess our hunting community, it's a fine line between people seeing let's say a private lander planting food plots and trying to improve a herd for the overall herd and trying to take or control all those deer, you know, and that's where the dividing comes up, you know, and, and I get it, you know, it, it, it's, it's an easy thing to, uh, to see, but you have to recognize that a deer moves a lot. They move, they move, they move. 
and those political boundaries and private land boundaries don't mean anything to them at all. No. Nope. Uh, well, Jake, before we let you go, I guess a couple things. Number one, are you still uh, actively consulting and taking clients? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. So yep. if people want to get a hold of you, um, I guess, number one, are, are you mainly doing it in Michigan? Are you traveling at all? Um, I do travel. And uh, actually, Missouri is one of my favorite states. I do a lot of work in, in uh, central and northern Missouri. Very I've got cool. some great clients out there. I just love working with. Okay. So if people want to reach out to you to, to potentially start talking to you about looking at their farm, where, where should they where should they visit um, or how should they get a contact? My, uh, my email, jake at habitatsolutions360.com. I've got a website, habitatsolutions360.com, and then a Facebook page, Habitat Solutions 360, and a YouTube video, Habitat Solutions 360 LLC. Perfect, awesome. man. I can't believe we got through an entire podcast man. with you, Jake, without <laughs> talking about hinge cuts, because like, yeah. I know, yeah, I know we people never are even- good- Never even talked about the controversial uh, well, well, hitch cuts. So. We'll have you back on yeah. another time. Well, and, uh, yeah, you know, we'll do that sometime. The, I, I, I'd be happy to do that again. The reason oh, I, I didn't really dive into it, Jake, is like, obviously, we're in September. Like, people are thinking hunting season. You know, I, yep. I think maybe once we get yep. through the hunting season, we come back, we bring, we circle a whole one around habitat with January, you. And February. Yeah, that'll be a, a really yep, good time get, frame. You get that January, February time. There you and, go. And a lot of habitat guys call it hinge cut season. Uh, you know, yeah. It's, it's, Let's plan it, man. Well, Jake, listen, we okay. appreciate you coming on. It's been really well, I, cool. I appreciate the invitation, too. Man, it, so. what a what a fun time to learn about it. We <laughs> wish you the best this season. Uh, obviously, keep us updated as, as you get through the season. And, yeah, let's plan on circling back in January and February. All right. Well, good luck, you guys. I hope you all uh, reach your goals this fall. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jake. Well. We appreciate right. it, buddy. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, very really cool. cool. I t- uh, we, we say this a lot, but when you – have conversations with people that are just you know that they're as passionate about this stuff as you are it's just easy you know well it's just i mean it yeah makes you feel not not alone you know yeah and there is i mean there's more of us out there than than we probably originally thought but like you know uh, you talk to jake and like you can just see i mean that you know for most of his life he's just been ate up with with deer and habitat and management and and again you know, I think there's a lot of people that really love deer hunting, uh, and there's still a lot, but fewer than that, that love just everything about deer. Like I probably love the habitat and growing and, and watching and, you know, just seeing deer <laughs> as much as I do hunting. Well, them anymore. We got into a little bit on that podcast. Like it, it just, it's really interesting to try to understand the obsession that it, that it is like, you know, I'm not, I'm not just saying this cause it's like, oh, we have a hunting podcast and stuff. It's, dude, when I. Like when I lay my head down at night, like in bed, it's like, I, I just like, my mind is racing. I'm like these uh, imagining just a buck that's going to come through a certain funnel. Or I'm like, I'm considering all, you know, all of the different conditions that what we're going to face this What do I need to do here? Season. Where do I need to set this thing? I mean, up. I'm just obsessed with it. Like, and it's, yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you, you need to obviously keep your priorities in line here. Like, you know, my, my marriage is, is more important <laughs> than that and stuff. Yes. And so that, that's a real thing too. But it's like, dude, I just love it i just love it well and it you know i i want to call it out if you get this far in the podcast like there obviously are some sensitive things in that podcast that are going to get people fired up and we're going to talk about separation listen at the end of the day we're we're not first of all we are here to talk about the difficult things the things that people aren't talking about we bring them up purely because nobody else is talking about them. yeah well and, and dude just because we're on one side of the fence like specifically with the compound or crossbow issue like th- dude that doesn't at all mean that we don't like um um <laughs> want you guys to enjoy hunting and be out there even or, or not, you know at a personal level it's like listen we're all we're all people i we're literally all hunters. own like there's i own crossbow my kids will be shooting a crossbow so somebody said well you should talk about cross my kids literally will be shooting a crossbow over a bait pal on Saturday. Yeah, they will. And, and I have no problem with well, that. Dude, at, at the end of the day, like, and you just heard me say how much I love it, how much obsessed I am with it. Like d- they're just deer, you know, at the end of the day, yeah. I think the human, human relationships and like, you know, our, just our community as hunters, it, it is more important to me. I will say um, the thing that probably does keep me up and, and more so with the podcast and and I appreciate everybody commenting and getting involved is like to hear people say like we I don't know 
I don't want to say shaming hunters, but we don't care about them as hunters is not true. It's not true. Like it, it, it's very far from the truth. Like literally we we're super passionate about deer and hunting in the community and we're not trying to put anyone down. Frankly, if anything, we're trying to understand you as hopefully if you're listening to this, you're starting to understand us. Yeah. And in the passion of a, like a debate or, or conversation about hunting, I mean, I can understand why it could come across. If I, I, I get it. Mm-hmm. I understand. Yeah. And it, and I'm, I'm not trying to make you be us either. Like I'm not trying sure. to make you only kill four year olds and only use compound bows and only shoot ho- like that's not what we're trying to do it's just the reason we have these discussions is so that it's the only way to get a rouse out of somebody so that we can hear their viewpoint if we if we just agreed with everything nobody would comment nobody would say you guys are idiots like crossbows are a real thing too like it, it, we have to say these things so that we bring this discussion to the forefront otherwise guess what as a community nobody talks yeah and, well, and everybody we don't, and says, we don't just do it because it's like a it's a it's a heated topic at all. Like we're not trying to get a rouse on anybody. It's just it just I what, want people it just to what's talk. happening. It's what we're it's what we want to talk about. And I want to hear. There are so many differences of why you <clears throat> hunt and what you hunt with and why you do it and why you love it. That if we don't get you to talk about it, nobody will know, and and we won't know, and you guys won't understand us, and and so you know whether you relate to us now or you're the complete opposite of us, like I want to continue to to grow this discussion and to have these things. Listen, we it's September first. There is not a person listening to this thing probably in mid September that's not excited about deer season. Like it is here, it is at the forefront. If you're listening to this and you don't like, you've, you're not excited. Maybe it's because you never hunted before and you should do it. Because all of us listening to this should be excited about what the next few months has in store. Um, and whether you're a crossbow guy or a compound guy or you're a rifle guy or whatever, uh, you should be excited. And and that is a commonality that you need to look around and say, holy shit. All of these people, though they do it for a different reason, are excited about the same damn thing I'm excited about. Yeah. Yeah. And what else is there? Yeah. So, anyways, that's it. Cool. In a world of love together. Yeah. All right. Well, till the next one. Yeah. Episode 91 with Jake Elinger. Uh, we appreciate Jake. What a what a cool discussion to have there. We'll definitely get him back talking about habitat and stuff in probably January and February, but um, it's hunting season now. Yeah. Appreciate you guys listening. Uh, I forgot to say at the beginning, so give oh. us yeah, give us a follow, like check the notifications on YouTube. Subscribe. Um, yeah. If you want to, you know, continue to get notifications. We're dropping videos every Tuesday, 6 p.m. Mm-hmm. Uh, almost at 100. So that's exciting. And uh, we're about ready to be in the woods. All right. We'll see you next time. Later. It's take me. Oh.